Well, it's good to see everyone tonight. Uh, Tonight, I want to introduce you uh, to a man. This man. And not just because he has great hair, though, you know, that look certainly would be wooing some women at some point in time. But rather because he has quite a unique story. This man's name is Carlos Henrique Raposo, um, otherwise known as Casia. That's what he was called. Carlos Casia. That was his nickname. And he was a Brazilian man who had a wonderfully unique career of 26 years. A wonderfully unique career of 26 years. Unique that he never played a game of professional football or soccer while living the lifestyle and being part of a number of professional footballing teams for 26 years. This was Carlos Kasia. Now, the thing that he did have was fitness, okay? So he went down from Brazil, or went up, sorry, shall I say, from Brazil to Mexico, and he went out to train for a team there, and they were impressed by his fitness, his ability to run, and he got signed up. And at the time, a lot of these contracts, he was born in 1963, uh, contracts were kind of, you know, three, four months long. This is kind of how it went down. And so uh, he he got signed up for for one of Mexico's uh, top teams, And then uh, he impressed during training. And then when it came to the actual game day for him to play football, we're going to call it football, um, he feigned a hamstring injury and, of course, was left on the bench. He would do this for the entire duration of his contract. He would spend the entire contract of his time in Mexico on the bench. Now, he went on to uh, head back down to Brazil and sign up to all four of Rio de Janeiro's top clubs, which he kind of, again, asked the question, how? Why did this happen? Well, he was fit. He would impress impress people at these trainings. They would see how well he could run, even though he had no soccer skills whatsoever, and they would sign him up, and as soon as it was about to be game day, again, he would feign an injury. A hamstring was the most common, and again, he would never actually play. At the time, it was very difficult for them to diagnose the fact that he would have a hamstring injury, and so he got away with it. Not only would Kasia do this, he began to befriend journalists, journalists and other players who would then publish fabricated stories and vouch for him, increasing his status as a player, which then allowed him, of course, to get more and more contracts, to play, so to speak, with more and more clubs. Now, again, this kind of blows our mind. How did Carlos Kasia get away with this? Well, he used to also uh, show videos of him playing. And you might say, well, how could you possibly show a video of him playing? He never actually played a game. Well, this is one of his tactics. Um, Fortunately for him, he looked uh, much like a Brazilian national player, Renato Gaucho. And so he would show footage of Gaucho scoring goals in packed out stadiums. And again, his status as a footballer would increase, allowing him to get signed up for more and more clubs. He went over to France to continue his football career. Now, over in France, uh, Kasia proclaimed how at a grand unveiling, okay, so he was there, he was being signed up, it was going to be his time to play, that when uh, he was kind of unveiled and when the stadium opened, instead of doing some kind of kick-ups and doing some shooting, what he did was he kicked the balls into the crowd and he kissed the logo on his shirt, immediately becoming an absolute crowd favourite, you know, because he was the entertainer, the one that they loved, but of course then he would get an injury and again sit on the bench. Because this way, he didn't have to show that he had any footballing skills. At one point, one club's owner became so frustrated and tired of being injured that he demanded that Kasia play. You must play. So Kasia started to panic about finally having to get onto uh, the ground. And just as he was about to get up, there were some fans in the, in the stand behind him. He started to kind of hear some ab- abuse from the fans behind him. And so what did he do? He jumped the fence. Uh, into the supporters and started a fight. (laughs) He was desperate, right? So he started a fight with him. And this was a genius move for him because, of course, what choice did the umpire have but to give him a red card, not allowing him to play? Not only this, not only this, he defended his actions by saying that the fans were hurling abuse at the owner and this consequently earned him a contract extension. What an interesting fellow. Now, he is known in history and to history as, of course, a con man, the footballer who never played football. And if you want to find out more of his story, there's a documentary on Amazon Prime that you can watch all about him. 
a fascinating story. So why do I introduce you to this man beyond his hair? You see, he in his career had all these labels, but he never played a game. He had all these jerseys, but he never played a game. And for some people, this is somewhat expressive of how they go about doing faith. Now, while I don't suspect people do this with intention, I want to make that really, really clear, there is always the risk that as Christians, we feel like we're on the team, but we never actually play the game. Some churches are even structured in such a way that encourages this. People attend the team huddle on a Sunday, they get the comradeship, they get the journey, so the Guernsey on, you know, they get a pep talk from the coach, people get to vouch for us, maybe they even start a fight, you know, like, you know, things are getting exciting. But then when it comes to the rest of the week, they sit on the bench. And I want to make it clear, particularly as we go through this series on who we are as a church, we are not that kind of church. You see, we do a lot of great things together. We do a lot of great things together, and Ian's going to share about the importance of that next week. But here at ASBC, we are not just a weekend church. We're more than Sunday Christians. We see our work as an act of worship, and we see our marketplace or wherever it is that God has placed us as a mission field. We believe that the whole world is God's, and he wants to use us every day. We are people on mission every day. This phrase we use a lot here at ASBC, everyone on mission every day. And those last two words, those last two words really, really matter to us. They chan- we channel much of our teaching and our resources into these two words, every day. You see, last week I spoke about us as a church being a kingdom people. Our king is Jesus and we're seeking to align ourselves with him and live a life that reflects his kingship. And we can hold on to onto that identity as a Christian really tightly. We can hold on to that call. But what does that mean when it comes to Monday, Tuesday, the rest of the week? What does it mean when we actually are out there in the battle, in the fight, when you don't have the pastor or the ministry leader to give you direction? What then? And that's what I want to explore tonight. You see, uh, the passage that we're going to be looking at is a famous story of David and Goliath. At least that's how it's often titled. But tonight, I want to give you the heads up, we're not going to get to the point where David slays him. Because I'm far more interested in this story tonight, in actually the comparison and the, and the kind of contrast that exists between David and King Saul. Because it speaks so much to what it looks like for us to embrace mission every single day to be faithful every single day. So if you've got your Bible, feel free to turn with me to 1 Samuel Samuel chapter 17. Now, I'm going to be doing quite a bit of text, but at the same time, there's going to be some gaps because it is actually a really, really big story. And I just want to focus on a few kind of highlights. But to give you some context, it says, Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons. And in Saul's time, he was very old. That's Jesse was old. Jesse's three older sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Okay, so just to kind of set the scene here, because I realize that there's kind of some backstory here. We've got the Israelites fighting against the Philistine army. And back in, in those days, a method of battle was essentially that um, you would meet at a ravine or you'd meet at kind of an area that was a large landmass so you could see each other. And each day you would come down and you would line up your army. Now, in this case, what would happen is, and there's a particular Hebrew word for it, which I didn't look up, I should have during the day, but there's a word where basically you send out your champion. This is your best fighter, right? Because both teams know, both armies know, that it's not a great outcome just to slaughter each other, right? It, it, you know, that's not a good outcome. Actually, kind of just going at it will not produce the best outcome. In fact, we just want to know who's ultimately going to win. So let's give your best fighter against our best fighter. Let's see who ends up top dog, and let's just declare them the winner, 
right? So this is essentially how battles would go. And Goliath from Gath, he was a towering man, and you can read the description about him. He was this incredible warrior, and he was coming out every single day and hurling insults at not just Israel, but the God of Israel. And people were scared. You'll see this in a moment. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roast grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, like I was saying, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. So he did his job. He was following the instructions of Jesse. I want you to deliver the food and then I want to go check in on your brothers. So David did his job. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king, that is King Saul, will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. So it's a pretty sweet deal. Saul's out there somewhere. We'll learn about him later. But he's basically saying, hey, if you can take down this guy, it's going to be a pretty sweet deal for you. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? What David said a little bit further on was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. So just really like fascinating story. We often talk about David and Goliath, and I suppose we kind of picture like David out there kind of doing his thing. But if you actually look at the backstory, what's fascinating is David's only reason for being out there in the battlefield was because he was a cheese delivery system. Bread and cheese. He was taking out bread and cheese to his brothers and finding out how the battle was going. This is why David was there. He wasn't called out there specifically as a warrior. He was called by his father to go and check on the battle and he brought his cheese, he brought the bread, he brought the ephah of grain, he brought what he needed to do. But then when he got to that place, that place of the battle, he heard something. That disturbed him. And this is a fascinating lesson on what it looks like for us to not be a Kasia and to not just be a Sunday Christian, but to actually understand that all of our life and our faith expression is God's. You see, we go about doing our business and many of our, us will have our various cheese delivery that we do. We step into our school, we step into our workplace, we step into our family, we know what we are called to do, we know why we are there, but then when we are in that place, we listen and we hear something isn't right. Maybe we overhear a conversation or we see a circumstance and we say, it is not supposed to be this way. The kingdom of God is not working in this place and I need to do something to bring about God's kingship and his way so we step in. We start off delivering cheese, then we overhear something, a conversation, a need emerges, and the question is in that moment, the question that would have resonated with David in that moment is, will we respond? You see, there are organized uh, official ministries of the church, and we really love those, but the church is people. And when you extend kingdom impact, when you extend kingdom invitation each day, you are being the church, whether it be official or not. So let's just take a moment as we see David here, a guy who's coming, not really supposed to be there in the grander scheme of things, and then hears a need and chooses to respond versus where is King Saul? Now, King Saul is, of course, we kind of learn somewhere, definitely not on the front lines. 
Now, interestingly, when Israel asked for a king, one of the things that they expected their king to do would be to lead them in battle. This is what the kings would do. They would lead them in battle. This is one of the reasons why the nation wanted a king, and yet Saul wasn't out there. He was elsewhere, throwing uh, suggestions, throwing favor upon somebody who would have the courage to respond to the need that had emerged in that state. I mean, Saul was supposed to be out there, not hanging back in his tent. And so the question that we are challenged with each and every day as the church on mission is, am I David? Where I'm listening and responding as need emerges? Or am I Saul? Am I sitting at the back, hoping someone else steps in? You see, both Saul and David were called to be kings. They were both anointed as kings. But it is one thing to receive the call. It is another thing entirely to act upon that call. And this is where we start to see that contrast emerge. In 1 Samuel 17, it continues, Saul replied, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. I'll come back to that in a second. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Like, so dramatic. Like, this is like, this is like this He-Man. Like, I wouldn't be anywhere near like this. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. And he says, I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Now, this is, this is just an amazing story, and, and, and there's so much depth going on here that we uh, miss, uh, and an amount of depth that I can't actually do justice to today, but a few quick things I just want to highlight here. Notice right at the beginning that David says, I have been tending my father's sheep. Now, whenever we hear the, the reference to a shepherd or that metaphor of shepherd, particularly in the Old Testament, but of course it's very prevalent in the New, this is a really significant metaphor because the idea of a sheep and a shepherd was a metaphor that was regularly used to describe the kind of relationship that God would have with his people. It's no surprise that David was a shepherd. It's no surprise that Moses spent a long time as a shepherd. It's no surprise that Jesus was called the good shepherd in the New Testament. This was a really significant metaphor that God would use with his people, knowing that they needed guidance and care and support. Now, we see this, David's declaration of, I have been looking after my father's sheep, in comparison to Saul. Now, does anyone know what Saul was doing when we first introduced to him? Donkeys. Yeah, specifically, what was he doing with donkeys? He was trying to find them. So, so when we actually learn about King Saul, who would later become King Saul, essentially we see him as this kind of donkey finder, this almost donkey herder kind of character. Now, if you've ever been to Israel or you've ever seen videos of Israel, you can see a stark contrast between sheep and donkeys and the way that they attended. You see, sheep actually do follow instruction when they understand their master's voice, whereas donkeys just do what they want. They go everywhere. And this was, of course, a metaphor for the state of Israel as it was occurring in real time. Essentially, he was being reminded, hey, hey, I have been looking after my father's sheep. I have been stepping into the role that God created uh, us leaders of his people to be. Meanwhile, like, how are your donkeys going, right? Because that is the state of Israel right now. So even though, like, th this is kind of going on just below the surface, this contrast between Saul, the donkey herder, and David, the shepherd. But there's something else going on here. Notice what David is armed with. Now, what was David famously armed with? Someone tell me. 
A sling, a sling. Okay, so David's armed with a sling. And you might think, a sling? Well, that just happens to be the weapon of a shepherd. I've heard that preached before. Yes, that is true, of course. But this is really significant as well when we look at the contrast between David, the one who is taking the call, versus Saul, the one who is still back in the tent. Because David is armed with a sling and he is from the tribe of Judah. Now, interestingly, the sling was a renowned weapon of a particular clan, the clan of Benjamin. We know this because we have two very specific references that both come before and after this event. The clan of Benjamin was known for those who would wield the sling. They would say that the sling would be wielded in both the right hand and the left. In fact, in Judges 20 verse 16, it says, among all these soldiers, there were 700 select troops who were left-handed. This is from the triad clan of Benjamin, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss, right? So the clan of Benjamin was known for their use of slingshots, their effective use of slingshots, the right and the left, not missing by a hair. And David was from Judah, but where was Saul from? He was from the clan of Benjamin. So you got this kid armed with the weapon that Saul should be wielding, that represents his clan, that represents his specific area of expertise. And you got this young guy who's like, hey, I've been looking after my father's sheep, and guess what I got in my hand? Versus Saul, the donkey herder, right, who's sitting in his tent, who should be the one on the front lines wielding the weapon of his clan. And so the author is wanting to contrast David and Saul, both called to kingship, but taking very different paths, one on the bench, the other on the field. But that's just interesting stuff. The big message and the posture of David is one that uses what he already has to bring about God's will. And that's what I want us to reflect on tonight as we think about what it looks like to be active and engaged, faithful with every day. It isn't just about being a cheese delivery system, doing what we're faithfully seeking to do and then listening for the opportunities that emerge. It also means using and recognising what you already have. And this is exactly what David did. Saul tried to place his armour on David and he says, this is not going to work for me. This is not what I'm familiar with. This is not common to me. And what does David do? He reflects upon the ways that God has been faithful in his past. He says, hey, there's been times where I have taken down a lion and a bear and God has been the one to protect me. And so what David already has isn't just his clothes and his sling and his tools. He also carries a story of God's faithfulness. And so he reaches into this story just as he reaches to grab his tools and he says, God has given me exactly what I need to be the antidote to what I am seeing here. So what about you, Saul? (laughs) Yeah? This is significant. Because here at ASBC, I see this in so many different ways across the week and it is beautiful. I see people using what they have already and using it faithfully to honour God. Not only through workplace mission, though so many people do that. They say, you know what, God has equipped me with this knowledge and these skills, and I'm going to faithfully honour God with this each and every day. You are on mission every day. But also there are people who who, who dig deep into things that, that, that are beyond that. They go, I'm a great cook. See, I'll discover these things later. Somebody will be unwell and a whole bunch of meals will have just gone to them through the life of the church. I don't even find out they're sick yet. This is like after the fact. It's like not only are they sick, I'm like, oh, I feel bad about not knowing that, but also the church has already responded because a whole bunch of people who already are good at cooking already produced meals and already got them to them. It's amazing, you know. If you were to give me a, a set of scan pan and whatever I needed to cook, that would not be good for me. This does not suit me. I'd rather use my stuff, right? So, but people who have these skills, they go about and they just do it. They hear a need and they respond. There are people who are incredibly skilled in hospitality. That's what they do. And so when they find themselves in a situation where people are feeling nervous or anxious or need an environment where they can find peace, they craft this environment either at a workplace through what they place around the staff room or maybe even in a business where they set up a space where someone can feel at peace. And it's going beyond the job. It's saying, I've got something that I can offer here. 
It might be that somebody has special knowledge, legal knowledge or something like that or technical knowledge, right? And somebody is in need and it's not part of their job description but they are going about their business and encountering a person and they say, you know what, I've actually got some knowledge in this area. I can offer something here and I don't need the pastor to tell me to do it. I don't need to start a church ministry. I can just go ahead and do it because God has already equipped me with it. And even last week, I loved just that little story of, you know, all those boys in the rain because of bucketing down, just grabbing some towels and saying, hey, as a church, we've got towels. <laughs> but it takes someone to get the towels to them, to see the need, to be on their way to church delivering cheese, right? And then to hear and say, something is not right about this situation. What can we do? You see, we are faithful with each day. We're faithful with what we are called to do in the everyday, but we also listen, just as David did. And we position ourselves to be responsive, not just to be in the ten. And we ask the question, God, what have you already given me that could be used in this circumstance? I want to focus just on this image for a moment. And we've already read it, 1 Samuel 17, 40. As he approaches a Philistine, he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, and put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. I just love this image. I love this idea of going, hey, I know that there is a need. I know I need to respond, and I want to be prepared. I want to take stock of what I have to offer. You know, each week, each week, as we enter the week, we, we essentially we choose our stones. <laughs> We go, you know what, I'm going to be stepping into an environment, I'm going to be stepping into a battle of sorts, and that battle can take many, many different forms, but we, we, we get together and we choose our stones and we say, hey, God, what have you equipped me with? And each day we pray and we say, God, how are you going to use me today? Holy Spirit, where do you need to direct my attention? What are you going to bring to my attention that I otherwise will have missed? And I love uh, a phrase that I heard from a podcast I listened to recently. Uh, it was said, the stone would have been no good if it were left in the stream. It had to be picked up by David. It had to be used. And people can debate, did he need five stones, did he need one stone? I like the idea that he picked up five stones. He was ready. He was prepared for the battle. And this is what we do as a church. We take that which we have, we prepare ourselves, and through little acts of love in all kinds of places, we seek to bring about kingdom impact. There's always a temptation, and we know right here in Alice right now there's a lot of tension and anxiety, and if you're feeling like right now, please, I'd love to pray with you. We would love to pray with you. That's, that's real, and we get that. But whenever there is tension and anxiety, there is always a temptation to pull back, to retreat to the tent, right? That's a temptation, and, and all of us are susceptible to that, including myself. Can I encourage us as a church to be like David? To step in, to listen with greater care, to take up our rocks and place them in our bag, recognizing that we have something that God has already given us to offer. This is missional living at the core. And again, it comes with practice. David says, I have taken down the lion and the bear. It takes time and practice to understand that being a Christian, following Jesus, is more than just a label, more than just attendance, more than just being a Kasia. So rather than a Saul or a Carlos Kasia, may it be your desire to be a modern-day David delivering the bread and cheese, using what we have already been blessed with, selecting our stones to place in the bag, and then being open to wherever the kingdom needs to break through each and every day. You see, the disciples of Jesus would imitate this in the New Testament as well. Peter and John approached the temple. Approaching the temple, it's essentially like delivering cheese. They were going about their business as they would. And they came across a man who was lame from birth. And he cried out. He cried out. 
He needed help. He needed money. At least that's what he thought he needed. And Peter said, after asking him to look at him, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And I love this because it's just a beautiful little parallel. I'm not going to sit there too long, but there's a sense of like, hey, this is the same story. They're going about their business. They're being faithful. They see a need and they see this man and they say, this is not as it should be. And in that moment, there's a choice we can retreat or is there is the choice to step in. And even as they stepped in, they didn't have what this man wanted, but they had what God had already equipped them with. And so Peter declared as such. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. It's a cool story. It's a great story. Don't underestimate the significance of stepping in. You just never know how the kingdom may break through. The gospel is filled with stories of small seeds planted of the kingdom, producing results unfathomable, unexpected, far beyond what we could ever imagine. So, what does it look like for each of us to be faithful with each day? Because that's who we are as a church. That's what we're about here at ASBC. Everyone on mission every day. So deliver your cheese, whatever that looks like. Be listening to the need. Recognize how God has equipped you and how God has spoken into your story. Take your stones. Be ready to respond. Let's pray. Jesus, we just want to say thank you that we have these incredible stories of your provision, your love, your faithfulness. And God, we know there's all sorts of circumstances where maybe we feel like we're out of our depth. Maybe like it feels like the problem is too big, the giant is too tall. And yet, God, the first thing you ask of us is to listen and to feel that, that sharp sharpness inside of our heart when we know that your desires, your will is, is not occurring in these various areas of our lives. But we hear the needs of the brokenhearted and the fearful and the hurting. People who are looking for peace, looking for provision. Ultimately, God, we believe, looking for you. And so, God, may we find peace in the stories that you have given us where we've seen your work in your favour, just as David did. May we not try to squeeze into some sort of mould that isn't consistent with who we are, like a David trying to wear armour. But rather, God, may we be thankful in knowing that you have placed exactly what we need in our hands. And so, God, each day, whether it be a word of encouragement or an expression of some gift, or the power of a non-anxious presence. We take up that rock so that we can be prepared to use it for your kingdom, for your impact, for your glory. So just like the lame man, people would experience something of you and not praise us, but praise you as the good God. Amen.